you are live. So, hey, everybody. Dr. Joe is in the house. Thank you. And uh, I'd love to know where you're tuning in from. Just uh, you know, shoot me a, a message saying that, uh, you know, your name and possibly where you're tuning in from and uh, which city, state, country, universe, you know, just in case you're tuning in from, from Mercury or Mars or Jupiter, you know, it's always good to let Nikki know uh, she's the, you're headed to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's it called? Uh, you can let me know who you are. Okay, let's have a look. Brooklyn, New York, in the house. California, whoa, whoa, Sacramento. Yep, there we go. Finland. Oh, my goodness. I'm Dr. Joe's reaching Finland. Okay. Uh, Germany. Oh, my goodness. I tell you, Dr. Joe is truly global now. <laughs> I got a worldwide audience. And we got Atlanta in the house, Columbus, Ohio, Earth. Okay, well, Earth. Okay. <laughs> I got somebody calling you from Earth. <laughs> it's all good. Well, thanks a lot, Earth. <laughs> That's good to know. Los Angeles in the house, Orlando, Florida, South Carolina, and Brentwood, California. Thank you very much. And uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Oh, whoa. New York, California. Corny for you. You spelled it wrong. I'm sorry. I be I technology. You spelled it. Uh, I'm talking to uh, what's it called? Uh, Instagram. No. Yeah, Instagrams. Over here, and uh, I'll put it here. Right? Yeah, that's uh, what they call it. Uh, you are Facebook and YouTube. So, uh, welcome, and I hope you are all doing well. And we've got another one from Philadelphia, Toronto, East Meadow, New York, Augusta, and Venice Beach, California, Huntsville, Alabama, Massachusetts. Mike Awusu. That sounds like a Ghanaian name. Hi, Mike. Um, Paul. Paul, Brentwood, and Denver, Colorado. Milk, oh, I got somebody here from the Milk, Milky Way, huh? <laughs> I forgot to say. Okay, thanks a lot for the Milky Way. And uh, we haven't got anybody here from uh, Saturn yet. So, uh, you know, what's the other one? Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Earth, uh, <laughs> Mars, Venus. Oh, yeah, we haven't got anyone from Venus yet. So if you're, coming from, if you're checking in from Venus, let me know. Uh, New Delhi, oh my goodness. We got somebody from New Delhi. Oh my goodness. India. India is in the house. And uh, and so on. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for tuning in from wherever they are. <laughs> we got somebody from Pluto. <laughs> uh, Nikki, you got <laughs> Nick and Pockets is in Pluto. <laughs> you better tell Brandon I'm beating him. <laughs> I'm getting good. <laughs> You tell Brandon Turner, I got guests, I got readers, I got viewers from Pluto. <laughs> so, Brandon, look out. <laughs> oh, no, I'm having too much fun. Oh, I got something from Uranus. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious me. I tell you, this is, uh, I'm having too much fun. Anyway, I want to welcome you wherever you're calling from, wherever you're tuning in from, whether you're from Earth or or Venus or wherever. Welcome. It's about three what's the time? Three oh four Eastern time in the Washington DC area. Weather's not too bad over here today. It's pretty comfortable. Um, you know, hopefully it's uh, good where you are. And the topic of today is uh, how investors can prepare for a tighten or tighten in lending environment. Uh, how investors can prepare for a tightened or tightened lending environment. Uh, this is a take, uh, a continuation of a great article um, on Bigger Pockets from Matt, Matt Fairkoff. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, check it out. It's a good article. And his article, which was, I think, sent out not too far ago, uh, it's called Rates Are Historically Low, But Extremely Hard to Get a Loan. Here's why, and quote, and what do about it. Okay, rates are historically low, but it's extremely hard to get a loan. Hmm. Here's why and what to do about it. There's an article written by Matt Fairclough, who is a, uh, a seasoned investor, uh, many years of experience, written a lot of great articles, 
And uh, I think this was uh, posted uh, recently uh, on Bigger Pockets with a lot of uh, feedback and comments and engagement. So I want to kind of, um, you know, kind of take it from there and give my spin, my take, uh, based on my experience, um, you know, as an investor through all cycles and, uh, you know, for the last 30 years or so. So, um, okay, let's have a look. Okay, sorry about the telephone in the background. It'll disappear in a second, so just bear with me. Hopefully. Okay, so as I said before, uh, I've been through uh, four real estate cycles, and uh, we all know what a cycle is. Uh, it goes through real estate, you know, cyclical, so it goes through different phases. Um, you know, it's an upswing, which is what we've been through for the last several years, and uh, we kind of reached the peak. And it appears that we may be, I don't know, we may be going on a, uh, on a sort of a, a slope down, which is what they call recession phase. Uh, nobody knows uh, where sort of COVID-19 uh, really kicked in. And given the, um, you know, the, the unemployment figures that was uh, posted today, it's pretty depressing. Uh, about 14 point something percent unemployed uh, in the U.S. right now. And uh, obviously that's going to have an impact uh, generally throughout the economy. It's also going to impact on real estate as well. So, um, yeah, so, you know, having been through some of those downturns and upturns, um, uh, a certain sign, certain things, um, you know, come into play. And I want to share some of that with you. So, as we know, uh, you know, given the uh, announcement today from the Commerce Department, I think it is, uh, we're at 14 point something percent, nearly 15 percent unemployment. I don't know if that's the peak. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, this the way this COVID-19 is playing out, it may even go higher. So uh, I don't think it's going to get to the point of the, the Great Depression. Uh, but it's definitely uh, second to that right now. So it's not looking good. And, um, you know, and the signs aren't looking good. So what we're experiencing, which what everybody knows about, is wages, <clears throat> people losing their jobs, and, uh, you know, people having their hours cut. And one day you got a job, next day you don't have a job. Uh, I know that a lot of states and governors are trying to uh, open up, uh, but generally a lot of people are just not comfortable and confident to go outside or <laughs> resume normal activity as we were, you know, three, four months ago. So it's definitely a new day. Uh, I don't see sure how it's going to play out because this one's slightly different from the last 2008, uh, 2009 uh, downturn. Uh, this one is just radically fast. I mean, it's like, where did this thing come from? And uh, things are changing rapidly, very, very, you know, almost like warped speed. And, uh, and so on. But one thing that is clear, though, absolutely clear, is that we are in a new environment in terms of finance. We're in a new environment in terms of getting access to funding, access to credit. It's a new day. <laughs> you know, the, the days of, quote, unquote, easy money, uh, it's pretty much done. It's gone. Um, you know, and the signs are there. In fact, I was speaking with uh, a loan officer yesterday, uh, a good friend of mine, and uh, who uh, I've known for a number of years. We've done a lot of deals together, uh, and so on. I'm just kind of getting his take <clears throat> of that. And uh, he was saying that essentially, you know, um, that his bank or their bank are being a lot more conservative now. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, uh, they're being a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more due diligence. Uh, they're requiring more reserves uh, from lenders. There's uh, certain types of businesses that they are absolutely not renting, uh, borrowing money to. Um, I know that uh, when he joined his bank, and uh, you know, he was trying to explain to his uh, superiors, uh, you know, senior management, he's a, he's, a, he's a senior VP, so the people up there, uh, about what I did, what I do. And as you all know, I do buy and hold, implementing the birth strategy, but primarily rent into Section 8. Okay, that's what I do, and I've talked about that in past uh, uh, pod, podcast, live streams, and uh, about why I do Section 8. Uh, the benefits of that, especially in sort of environments and times like this where you have a guaranteed income source. Um, this week, uh, in fact, it was May the 4th. 
May the 4th, which was four days ago, uh, I checked my bank account and all my housing authority payments were there. Every single payment to the last cent was there for all my tenants. Okay. And most of my tenants, uh, you know, uh, I have voucher holders and non voucher holders. Uh, the ones who, uh, who are about to hold it, they, um, they just pay a small portion of the rent. So if the rent of a house is, let's say, for argument's sake, $4,000, um, a tenant may pay $500 and the housing authority may pay the, the $3,500. So on May the 4th, uh, I checked my account and that $3,500 was there. Okay? Electronically, like clockwork, it's always been that way. The last thirty years, uh, how, uh, you know, in terms of the length of time I've been sort of uh, associated with that uh, uh, Section Eight program, so it's a very reliable, um, you know, guaranteed income stream, and it really does come into play in times like this. So I'm just now responsible for collecting the, the five hundred dollars uh, that the tenant's portion may be. Okay. So at least I know that every month, as long as that tenant is in the house, I'm going to get $3,500. Come what may. You know, and then I'm just responsible for collecting the 500 for the tenant. But because of the house that I have, I have very nice houses in, in desirable locations, which means that the tenants want to stay there. So they, for the most part, they pay their rent. So you don't have those concerns that I may have if I had a regular tenant who's paying $4,000. If that tenant lost their job, um, I may not be able to get that $4,000. And given the moratoriums that are playing out <clears throat> in most of the most parts of the country, uh, including this area, we are in the Washington, D.C. area, you can't even file for eviction anyway. So if they didn't pay that $4,000, for example, there's not a whole lot I could do. I'll have to wait till the moratorium period is finished. Uh, but obviously, you'll try to work with the tenant and to see if you can come to some kind of payment plan but the, the, the reality is that uh, your options are very uh, limited uh, given the moratoriums that's playing out in the country and so on. So, so, so I say that. So, so the point is that he explained to his, um, uh, this is the banker now, uh, to his uh, uh, superiors or you know, senior management about my business model. And, uh, you know, several months ago, they didn't really understand it. Uh, but now they do understand it. And he was sharing with me. No, it's not going to be a problem you getting money uh, as we move forward because uh, your income stream is very stable. You have a track record of uh, knowing what you do. You have a proven track record of paying your uh, bills on time. And, uh, and therefore, for the most part, you're not going to have an issue. So although uh, I, I, you know, I bring it all together by saying this, in downturn, banks, lenders, and so on will still lend money. I mean, it's not like they stop lending money. They will continue to lend money. But what changes is who they lend their money to, what they lend their money for, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, the approval processes in order before they release those funds. That's what changes because that's how they make money. They make money by lending money. Okay. If they don't lend money, they don't make any money. So their first thing, obviously, is not to lose money, but they make money by lending money, and they want to continue lending money, but the dynamics change uh, in a downturn. So uh, money is the, the grease that keeps that real estate machine going. Uh, once that grease dries up, the machine stops. And uh, so what I want to talk about today <coughs> is the grease is the money and what you and I can do in this environment, in this sort of tightening lending environment, to make sure that that grease is still there so that you can do your deals and hopefully you can sort of uh, be a beneficiary of some of these opportunities that's going to take place in the coming few weeks, months, and possibly years in this tiny market. Okay? So uh, the other thing that he, uh, the banker uh, told me about is he says, uh, you know, be careful. I mean, he wasn't talking about me, but, you know, uh, about some of these forbearances and sort of, uh, you know, deferment programs which some of the banks uh, are offering. So be careful. I mean, some of those people who, who take those, it's going to come back to bite them. 
because uh, when the in the future, once the dust settles and you then start applying for financing, they'll find out, or one way or the other, I, I, I'm assuming, that you were a beneficiary of a forbearance agreement or you asked to deferment it, something like that. So he was saying that it doesn't code well on your business model uh, if it appears that you weren't able to survive or, 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 or you know, be able to operate in this environment. And uh, and so on. So that was just something, a caution that he 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 shared uh, that the bank is sort of uh, making note is uh, you know, who are the ones, who are the business, who are the investors who are asking for uh, deferments, who are the investors who are asking for deferrals, who are the investors that are falling behind in their payments, who are the investors who are not making the payments, and uh, because at some point. You know, when it's time for you to uh, continue in uh, purchasing properties, then all this stuff may come out. And it just doesn't look good that you are a savvy investor, but you're unable to pay your bills. Uh, so if you're asking them to borrow you money, it just doesn't look good that you're unable to pay your dues or pay your bills, pay your expenses when, you know, the, the, you know, when, when, when the uh, rainy day came. So again, uh, you know, it's important that you look at your business model. Uh, now is the time to sort of uh, get your act together. And what I'm going to talk about today is some of the things that you can do to be what I call bankable um, as we kind of transition into a, a tightened, tightening uh, lending environment. Okay, so, so from, uh, so I've talked about, you know, finance is going to get more difficult. I've talked about, uh, you know, it's a new day. The one thing I really do know, though, is that um, the important, in, a, in a downturn, the importance of relationships, um, uh, especially with your lenders, uh, nurturing that relationship. You know, I said I, I, I made a call out. What if actually the bank called me? I didn't call. He reached out to me. Just, just touch your base. And uh, but it's it's the time now to start. Developing, nurturing those relationships with your lenders, whether it be your banker, hard money lenders, uh, uh, private money lenders, and so forth, because uh, you know uh, they need to understand how you are going to operate in this new day. You need to explain to them uh, what your plan A, plan B, plan C are, and how you're going to weather the sort of turbulent environment that we're going to be experiencing. And they want to know. And, uh, you know, and, and so if I'm able to, for example, I'm able to explain to the lender that, okay, $4,000 uh, rent, 3500 is a guaranteed income source, $500 I can collect from a tenant who loves, who wants to be in there. They understand that. It's not too sort of um, too difficult to understand and grasp. And therefore, there's a certain level of comfort from a lender perspective that I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, survive uh, during these sort of uh, difficult times and uh, so on. So, so in terms of getting yourself together in this environment, the first thing is really to analyze your financial situation and uh, and really get your financial house in order. Okay, um, what I'm, what do I mean by getting your financial house in order? Uh, it means things like evaluating your um, your spending habits. Okay. And uh, most of the lot of software out here that uh, you can use to track where your money is going. Uh, money is almost like a, a boat, you know, if that is the right analogy. It's a boat, and, uh, you know, if you're not careful, there'll be lots of leaks coming from the boat. And uh, if you don't track those, then the next thing you know, the, 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 the ship will uh, drown and uh, will sort of uh, you know, collect too much water. So it's important to sort of uh, take the time to understand uh, your expenses, how your money's going out, and, uh, and sort of monitor those things, look at them, and figure out exactly where savings can be made. And, uh, and I think I've shared before, the biggest two expenses that most people have or incur are housing expenses and transportation expenses. So look at your housing uh, you know, uh, you know, expenses and see if there are some savings that you can make there. Uh, you know, is there anything you can do to cut down on that? Are there strategies that you can incorporate to hopefully
actually, um, you know, reduce those. I mean, you know, common ones that we all know are things like uh, house hacking, where you can share uh, part of your space in your home. Uh, you can get roommates um, if you, um, you know, if you don't own the home. You can get roommates. Maybe there's some space in the house that you can rent out to get some additional income. Uh, or you may even have to go and live somewhere else where you can uh, reduce your housing costs. But housing costs are by far the biggest expense that most people have. And uh, if you can make savings there, it's a lot more, uh, the return is a lot more better than, um, you know, stop not going to Starbucks, you know, three days a week, but just going two days a week uh, and save $5. You know, that's not really going to do a whole lot. Uh, but if you can cut your housing costs from five thousand to five hundred by getting a roommate, then that is a, a major dent in your expenses. So look at what, look at your uh, expenses, the outflows, and also see if there's any opportunities to increase your income, and uh, and take time to sort of uh, evaluate that and do some soul searching if there are possible changes there. And the next thing is part of that sort of getting your house in order is your credit score. Uh, lenders are definitely increasing in the, uh, the, the credit requirements. Uh, before you can get money from the mid fives, uh, if you had a score of 500, 550, 600, you, you, you could have got uh, financing uh, a few months ago. Nowadays, to get financing, you really need a, probably a 700 now. I mean, it, it was 650 a few weeks ago, uh, but speaking to the lender yesterday, it looks like they're looking for you know, 700. Uh, minimum credit score just to get money. So it's clear that, um, you know, lending, uh, the credit requirements are changing to your score requirement. So if your score is not that great, now is the time to sort of look into that and see if there's strategies that you can do uh, to increase your score. If you have to go to credit repair, then so be it. Uh, but lenders are looking uh, closely at your uh, credit score and uh, because it does indicate your ability and willingness and a uh, you know, track record of pain. Um, you know, also establish your emergency fund and savings and reserves. Uh, I think I've talked about that. I think most people know that, so I don't really need to talk too much about that. Uh, for a rainy day, you need to have some money set aside. If you're going to do real estate investing, you do have vacancies, you do have um, expenses that are uh, incurred, and uh, you do have, uh, you know, things happen. You know, hot water, water heater may break down or, or leak or the AC may go out on you. All these things may happen. A tenant may not pay you uh, and you can't evict. If you're in a high, um, in a landlord, sorry, in a tenant friendly jurisdiction like where we are, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not always easy to uh, to evict somebody quickly. So you've got to have some reserves to be able to uh, you know, uh, uh, withstand that rainy day. And then, um, you know, and the other thing, which is, uh, as I said before, is really the importance of relationships. Now is the time to, to do the research, given where you are, your locality, wherever you are in the country. I know we have people from Mars and Jupiter and Uranus and Venus and on, this, on this call right now. I'm not too sure if there are any loan offices over there, but uh, if there are, you may want to check them out. They may have two heads or three heads, but, you know, hopefully, <laughs> you know, uh, they speak English. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, and um, but otherwise, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of um, uh, you know local lenders as opposed to large national lenders. So now is the time to seek out for the uh, local lenders, what we call portfolio lenders, in your wherever you are. So um, portfolio lenders, uh, these are folks who keep money in the house. Um, they keep money within their sort of uh, their bank or lending institution as opposed to selling it to a secondary market like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and things like that. Uh, because they keep the, the money in-house, there's a bit more flexibility in terms of their lending requirements. Um, you know, some of the, the, the larger national banks, you know, sort of the Bank of America's Chase, uh, you know, uh, Wells Fargo, those guys, uh, you know, it's usually very difficult to develop some real relationships with people who can actually make a decision because uh, a lot of the decisions are made elsewhere. And uh, so, you know, so because of because those decisions are made elsewhere, it's sometimes hard, harder for your point of contact to the bank to give you some wiggle room um, because he or she may not be able to make decisions anyway. 
whereas if you go to a local lender, uh, you know, the decisions are usually made locally and they understand the local market and uh, you can sort of take the time to note your relationships with these folks. And therefore, um, you know, if there's a gray area, then uh, what's it called? It, it, you know, they may sort of advocate on your behalf such that, um, you know, you may be actually able to get the funding. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of uh, sort of developing those relationships with local institutions, uh, wherever you are, portfolio lenders specifically. And uh, if you don't know where you find those, um, you know, do, go on Google or you can go to your local REA, uh, Real Estate Investor Association group, or speak to some folks who are kind of uh, in that arena. And they'll uh, give you some referrals of, uh, of, of banks or individuals uh, within those banks who, um, you know, who you can sort of uh, reach out to. It's even better if that person can actually make a, a referral or a warm lead or a warm recommendation on your behalf uh, to that uh, to that bank. So reach out to them and start nurturing uh, those, um, you know, at least reach out to them. But, okay, so what do I mean by reaching out to them? You know, because you don't want to just call them and say, hey, hi, um, you know, I need money. Uh, give me some money. Uh, cause that's probably not a good way of uh, going about it. Um, what I uh, suggest that you may want to consider doing is to um, develop what I call a credibility kit uh, beforehand, before you reach out to anybody. A credibility kit is really a document uh, which sort of uh, you know, tells who you are, uh, your story, uh, what you do, and uh, why you do what you do. A, a typical, at least the credibility that I, 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 I use, that I've developed, um, it really addresses uh, six things. Uh, who you are, uh, what you do, you know, um, what makes you different uh, from everybody else that's trying to get money. Um, you know, uh, fourth thing may be, you know, what do you want from this, um, you know, you know, this potential investor or bank or institution? And five uh, would be, you know, how are you going to protect that money? And six would be uh, why they should do business. Okay, so six things. Let me just summarize again. One is who you are. Two is uh, what did I say? One is who you are. You know what you do. What makes you different from everybody else that's trying to get money. Um, you know what you want from them. Five would be how are you going to protect that money if they give it to you. And six is why should they do business with you. So these are the key six questions that uh, I feel. You should that your credibility kit uh, should address, and um, you know I've taken the time to develop my credibility kit, and this is not the time for me to go into much detail about that. But uh, you know there are samples out there that you may want to uh, check out. But what it does is that it differentiates you from all the other people that's out there that's trying to approach these banks. Uh, you don't want to be pigeonholed into what I call the boot camp graduate. Uh, the, the boot camp graduate is, you know, you know, you know, you know, these people who go to a boot camp, one of these gurus, and next thing they know, uh, they give them a binder. They're all excited. You know, I'm gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna take on the world, and everything's gonna be great. You know, uh, Hawaii, here I come. You know, I'm gonna tell my tell my boss what I think of them. <laughs> tell, tell them what they can do with the job. You know, you know <laughs> just because they went to a boot camp. Yeah. Two days, uh, you know, you know, you know, everyone's all excited and you know, so on. So yeah, so uh, so what you want to do is differentiate yourself from that crowd, uh, because according to I don't know, page two hundred and thirty-six uh, of the of the binder, it says go get money. Uh, so uh, so how do you differentiate yourself from that person? You put yourself a, a credibility kit which addresses those things that I talked about. It tells your story. You have some experience. That you want to have photographs in there uh, before and after. Uh, if you want, to, uh, what's it called? Uh, explain the system. You know uh, what you do, how you're able to sort of navigate through those uh, different phases of the of the real estate life cycle. All that stuff should be in the in, in the credibility kit because it, what it does it gives you confidence uh, when you tell uh, when you meet with uh, the bankers or the private investors or lenders or or whoever, or hard money lenders, it, it, it really it, it gives you the confidence uh, to be able to tell your story. And you have a talking point. You have something which you can go through 
with that person. And uh, it's really, it, 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 it can be very compelling. And uh, I know the first time I did mine, uh, I, was, uh, I was going to request a line of credit. Okay? This is during the downturn. I was going to request a line of credit from a, a, a local bank. And uh, what I did was to put together, I mean, the, the bottom line is I put this thing together and uh, I was going to, um, I was you know, trying to figure out how much money do I need to get for this line of credit. And uh, I took the time to understand what the bank was looking for. I put together this documentation. I, I needed, I wanted to have a, a $500,000, half a million dollar line of credit. And being, me being me, I was advised, to maybe to increase that, to request more because you know when you when you want money you always ask for more um, because many times the banks negotiate you down. So I requested a million dollars uh, line of credit, um, you know even though I really needed five hundred thousand. Anyway, I put together this documentation. I took the time uh, to develop uh, what's it called uh, you know, some background of the bank and uh, the person I was going to need. And all this other stuff, which uh, the due diligence which I did, I put this package together, went to the bank, and lo and behold, after a lot of back and forth, they gave me approved or they approved me for a million dollars. So um, you know, that is not to brag or anything like that. But that's not the point. The point is, is that what I wanted to do is to differentiate myself from other people that approach these bankers all the time for money. Everybody wants money from these banks. Bankers, so they know, um, you know, this, this spiel that uh, people um, you know, approach them with. So I wanted to differentiate myself from all that crowd. And, uh, and that credibility it really did make a difference. So it, it does work, especially in times like now, when um, you know uh, the, the market, the, the credit market is tightening, and uh, banks have been a lot more conservative and been a lot more cautious uh, on who they lend and what they lend for. So uh, you know, revisit your strategy. Uh, your investment strategy. Are you a, uh, a fix and flip kind of person, a short term uh, investor? Uh, if so, then how are you going to be able to survive or thrive during this downturn? You know, short term strategies, I'm not a great proponent of short term strategies in the market like this because it's just too turbulent. And uh, so I'm more of a proponent of a long term strategy, uh, which will hopefully get you through this sort of period of uncertainty. And so as a, a long-term investor, then obviously you want to be able to explain how, you, uh, how you're going to be able to um, you know, survive and thrive during this sort of uh, uh, difficult times. Uh, so you have to be able to articulate your strategy, your systems, and uh, your team, uh, yeah, your assembly, whether it be your contractors, real estate agents, uh, you know, architects, uh, attorneys, all those things, all those people property managers that form your group or your team. I call the A team. And uh, so that they have a confidence that you're not just a one man show or a one woman show. You know, you are, you know, no man or no woman is an island. Uh, it's really a team effort, real estate. So they want to know that you've actually got a team together. If you don't have a team together, then you may want to uh, partner with somebody that has the experience and somebody that does already have that relationship such that you can sort of leverage on their team and their systems, and uh, and then you bring that person into your group. So these are things that uh, you may want to uh, consider. But uh, uh, you know, uh, a credibility can, can be a it really can be a game changer if you take the time to do it properly. And uh, I recommend, highly recommend, that you consider doing one. It's very very painful, very very painful. I had to go through it, and a lot of you know, version one, version two, version three. And um, you know, reviewing it with other people, and uh, if you have a friendly lender, um, uh, you know that uh, you can confide in. You may want to share drafts with that person, so that they can review it and uh, they can give you some feedback of what looks good, what needs to be changed, and uh, and so on. And it, you know, all the key points are being met, such that when you eventually do present it to the bank, you're good to go. So. Okay, so that's sort of uh, some of the things there. And finally, you know, I kind of talked about um, let's have a little different types of financing. Um, you know, we all know the different types. I've talked quite a bit about portfolio lenders 
and these are especially the local ones. Now the time to start developing those relationships with them uh, because they're local. You can nurture, and uh, you know you can really build some solid uh, relationships. So if there's a gray area, as I said before, if there's a gray area, it's always good to have an advocate in within the institution who is sort of uh, you know pushing it for you and uh, and being able to articulate you know why uh, you know you are a good candidate for for lending. Also, a lot of things that is that these these banks they like what they call deposit relationships. So uh, it may be worthwhile if you do is to consider putting some money into the institution. Uh, that also looks good, uh, more so than the major national banks, uh, the Bank of Americas, Wells Fargo's, and, and so on. You know, I mean, they got boatloads of money, uh, whereas the local uh, banks, uh, you know, they like to um, have deposit relationships uh, with people who they lend money to. So uh, it may be worthwhile to consider transferring some of your money from the national banks into the local uh, banks uh, if and when you do get approved for financing. Um, okay, then there obviously hard money is another option. Um, but I mean, what I'm hearing from hard money is that uh, you know those guys are changing as well. Uh, the easy money, hard money is pretty much over. A lot of the hard money lenders are being a lot more conservative now. Some of them are even run out of money, and uh, they're not borrowing uh, because hard money typically they borrow money from other sources and then lend it to you, uh, and they tack on uh, a premium on top of that. So if their source of finance is drying up, then their ability to lend money out to you and you and everybody on this call uh, is it's sort of reducing. So um, you know. So what may happen is that eventually is that the because money is getting tighter, and some of these hard money uh, lenders, uh, you know, are going to have to take back money, uh, take back properties because it's going to be increased in terms of debt, bad debt and foreclosures and things like that, they're going to be a lot more conservative also. In fact, they're probably going to start increasing their rates. Uh, so now you know, it's very easy, it's very, you know, it's very possible to get sort of eight, seven, eight, nine, ten percent money, one, two, three, four, five point, or one, two points. Um, you know, I have a funny thing again, I don't know, but just based on past experience, uh, those rates are probably going to increase. Um, and uh, you may get back into the old days of uh, teenage uh, sort of uh, rates in the sort of teens. You know, the, the 13, 14, 15, 16 percent, two, three, four, five points. I mean, it's, uh, I wasn't, you know, we, we, I've been through those. Um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I'm not, I hope we don't get back to those, uh, those days again, but if this sort of uh, difficult times stretch out, then we may, uh, you know, get back there again which means that it's hard for you to make money, um, you know, uh, or put it there, unless you've got some, a, a real meaty uh, project uh, whereby there's a you know, good sort of profit potential, it's going to be hard to fund. They're going to be a lot more conservative. Uh, their ARVs are going to go down and so on. So, I mean, it's just, a, it's just another a new day uh, if you're going to go after hard money. And, again, your credibility kit, is something that will differentiate you from all the other, uh, you know, uh, borrowers that are looking for, for money as well. And then the other third source is what we call private money. Uh, these are individual people, um, you know, who got money, whether it be self-directed IRAs, uh, whether they've got just money in, you know, in the stock market, and again, kind of sick and tired of that sort of roller coaster ride, and uh, they want to deploy those funds elsewhere. So, um, you know, so hard, so private money uh, could be a, a real good source. Um, but that's all about relationships also. It's all about individuals. It's all about sort of building trust um, that they get to know who you are. And uh, you've got to sort of demonstrate integrity. You've got to demonstrate that you're in person with your word. You're going to return them that money back. And you're going to do what it is that you say you're going to do. Uh, it's, it's very much, uh, you know, most people, uh, and this is the part which I disagree with a lot of these gurus on, is that a lot of these gurus, I don't know, for whatever reason, they say, you know, you have a luncheon, you know, somewhere in you know, a restaurant and give them some food, and, and somehow they're going to write you a check. Uh, 
I, I, that's not the way I see it. That's, that, that's not the way I, you know, that's not the way I've seen it anyway. Most people don't, aren't going to give you a check just because you got a nice, a nice PowerPoint presentation, uh, especially if, it's, if they're hard-earned money. Uh, I, I don't buy that at all. And that's why I, I completely disagree with these, these gurus who peddle those stories. Uh, it's just not realistic to me. Uh, most people, uh, most people don't have money to throw away, and I don't care if they. If I say to them, I'm going to offer you 20% of your money, or 30%, or whatever it is, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, if they don't trust you, if they don't believe that you know what you're doing, if they don't believe that you're going to return them the money, uh, if they don't believe that you have integrity, it really is meaningless. Uh, it, they're not going to be anything. Not one dollar. That's my experience, anyway. So the challenge for you is to build that, is to understand that, and uh, you know, and put your uh, and put things in place such that uh, you can address their concerns of uh, who are you, what's the, you know, have you done this before? Are you going to return my money? Uh, do you know what you're doing? And why should I trust you? You know, I mean, if I'm going to borrow my money, hard-earned money, I, that's the kind of question I'm going to ask. And uh, I feel that uh, most people. I'm going to do the same thing. If I just go up there with a with a fancy PowerPoint presentation, uh, say, "Hey, you know, yeah, look at my slides," uh, I don't know. I, I, to me, anyway, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but maybe you can tell me uh, if I'm uh, what's it called, right or wrong. But I mean, I, I wouldn't give money to somebody just because they had a nice PowerPoint presentation or they talked a good game. Uh, I want to do some due diligence on them. I want to make sure that uh, you know they know what you're doing. And they've got a track record and do what they you know what they're doing and uh, you know and so on. Now, if that person hasn't done it before, then that's okay. As long as they surround themselves with people who have. And that's where the team comes into play. Okay, that's where your relationships with people who've been doing this uh, comes into play. Therefore, you can now say my team comprises people with 10, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years experience. Okay. Now uh, you know, that looks a, a whole lot better. And if you just left the boot camp and you're trying to raise money uh, based on you know what the, the boot camp guru told you to say, uh, anyway. So uh, hopefully, let's go back to the original question. The original question was how investors can prepare for a tightening lending environment. Um, so hopefully, I've addressed many of those. I hope that I talked uh, about that uh, intelligently. Uh, as I said before, there was a great article written by uh, Matt Fairclough, uh, where his title was called Rates Are Historically Low, But It's Extremely Hard to Get a Loan. Here's why and what to do about it. So hopefully this discussion today, I've kind of built on that and uh, talked about you know what you can do, you know, uh, given the reality of where we are and what are some of the, the the action steps that you can take and uh, such that you can hopefully be positioned to become bankable uh, in this sort of turbulent times. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of opportunities that's going to be coming up in the next few weeks, months, and possibly years. And uh, looking back now, if I had, if I knew then in 2010, 11, 12, what I know now, Believe me, I would have bought a whole lot more housing than I did. And uh, believe me, I would have kept a lot more housing than I did. I sold, I split some houses, okay. And I regret. I mean, I don't know if you guys, you heard of Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill is a very desirable area in, in Washington D.C. And uh, I split some houses over there. I sold them. Uh, I don't know. I spent the money after you flip, you know, when you flip the house, you get some quick money, and next thing you know, the money's gone, and so you got to do it again. Uh, but, uh, you know, in hindsight, I probably should never have sold those houses. I should have kept them and, um, and so on. So if I knew then what I know now, I would have bought more houses. I would have kept more houses and, uh, I would have sort of uh, made sure I got my financial house in order and made sure I had my credibility kit and made sure that I do all those things which I shared with you today on this discussion. So hopefully it was an engaging discussion and, uh, if, uh, I'm going to kind of transition over to Q and A. Uh, I know that for the as as always, uh, what's it called? Uh, my 
my uh, my conversations. I was told this week that I talk too much. <laughs> my assistant Laura <laughs> told me I blabber too much. Okay? <laughs> I should cut it out. <laughs> you know, I, I should stop. Dr. Joe is talking too much. Do you believe that? <laughs> I tell you, do you believe her? <laughs> Am I yakking on too much? <laughs> uh, if so, if you think I'm yakking too much, uh, uh, so how much you got left? How, how much you got left on? Uh, we got 14 minutes, okay, on um, Instagram because it's 60 minutes before, before Instagram shuts shuts you down. <laughs> so, so if you think I yak too much. If you think, uh, if I'm boring you, <laughs> then uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, that's okay. It is what it is. If you think that you want me to continue blabbing, if you want me to continue talking, you're going to have to show me some love, okay? <laughs> you're going to have to tell Laura what you think of her. You're going to have to tell Laura she doesn't know what she's talking about, okay? So show me some love because my, my heart was broken earlier this week. <laughs> I was told I was talking too much. <laughs> You. <laughs> that's, uh, there it is, see? See, Laura, that's people I love me. There you go. Okay. Now, oh, I feel the love is coming down. <laughs> Even people in, in Mars love me. <laughs> the people in Mercury love me, I tell you. I've got global love and so on. Okay, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. So we're gonna go to Q and A, and so because of that, uh, what's it called? Laura's not gonna shut you down in uh, in twelve minutes. <laughs> if I didn't do that, you would, she would have come around here <laughs> and put one of those face masks on me. <laughs> Shut me down, okay? So uh, I'm gonna tell her it's okay. I'm sorry, but you know, uh, there's, there's too much love here, so they want me to continue. And so, on. so let's go to some Q and A, uh, and let's have a look where we are going. I'm gonna start off with uh, so shoot me your question, and uh, let's have a look. I'll go down. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with Nikki. Nikki, do you want to throw some questions first? Okay, this is from Brenda Grace. What was your main source of house purchases? Did you mainly buy from MLS wholesalers for house steps, short sales, etc.? Okay, this is from Brenda Grace. Good question, Brenda. What was your main source of house purchases? I'm assuming it's finance. Did you mainly buy from uh, MLS wholesalers for house steps? When I first started, uh, originally I would buy a lot of houses at the poor house steps. Okay. No, 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 no. When I first started, I'm sorry. It was just purely MLS, okay? Buying stuff on the MLS and, uh, you know, which is available to everybody. And I worked with uh, real estate agents and uh, they found me something and so on. I bought it and so on. So as time went by, I kind of transitioned more to the courthouse set where you go to the courthouse and then you buy a house. In Maryland, where in D.C., uh, you're buying a house as is in the courthouse. Uh, so if there's somebody in the house, then you're buying it with the people in the house, okay? And uh, so many times, you, uh, I remember even the house where I live in today, uh, we bought out of the courthouse, and we didn't even have a chance to go inside because there's somebody in here. So uh, what happened was that we drove by, it looked okay, and uh, I thought, okay, let me go make an offer on it. Uh, I went to the courthouse, and lo and behold, after a while, back in the forward, I was the highest bidder. And uh, and then uh, I came to the house, knocked on the door. Uh, the lady that was here wouldn't open the door. And uh, so I had to leave. I came back the next day, knocked on the door. She wouldn't open the door. I mean, I didn't even, I, I bought this house. Well, you have a contract to buy the house. Uh, in this area, you have 45 days, or between 30 and 45 days to close. And, uh, and so on. So the, the long story short, it's a lot more riskier. It's not like you're sort of FHA, HUD. Uh, VA type foreclosures where you get a chance to go inside. These are what they call trusty sales. Uh, you're buying the house as is, and if there's people in there, it's your problem. Uh, either way, you've got 45 days, 30 to 45 days to close. 
which means that you're going to have to get a loan, which means that you're going to have to get an appraisal. Uh, and the appraisal has to go inside the house. So there's somebody in the house who's not letting you in. And, and each day that goes by, the clock is ticking. So it's a lot more riskier. Uh, but, you know, that's what I used to do. I, don't, I stopped doing that because it's just too competitive. Um, but maybe I will return to that, uh, that business model, uh, you know, during the next downturn because there'll be fewer buyers and there'll be a lot more houses that will be in the poor house set. So hopefully I asked you a question, uh, Bre uh, Brenda, a question. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Trav Singer. Any worry that the housing department could run low on funds and have to lower your rents? Okay, I think you're referring to Section 8. Um, no, I mean, I said before, I've been doing Section 8 for about 30 years, and uh, there's never been a, a case, never, ever, uh, been a case where they didn't pay me uh, my money uh, as long as the tenant's in the home. Now, if the tenant's not in the home, obviously they're not going to pay you. But as long as there's a tenant in there, uh, you know, the rent's always there. Now, what typically may happen is during the downturn, uh, they, um, you know, they, they won't increase rents. So, uh, and sometimes uh, they do reduce rents for new, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, contracts. So, uh, so for instance, uh, if next year there's a downturn, they may say, okay, let's say the rent's $1,000 for a, a, a three-bedroom house in zip code A. Uh, next year, if the market slows down wherever you are, they may say we're going to reduce the rent from a thousand to maybe nine fifty. So you're still grandfathered in at a thousand. It's just that the new people coming in will be coming at nine fifty. Um, that's what my experience has been uh, in the program. So hopefully, I answered your question, uh, Trav, and uh, and so on. Okay, let's have a look. It shows you are humble. Okay, do you think? That it shows you are humble and willing to have others give you feedback. What's all that? <laughs> oh yeah, you see, see. <laughs> so uh, I'm humble, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I'm not very. I'm not, I don't brag. I'm just a regular guy, you know. And uh, sample family. Sorry for missing You can Google credible to get more info on that. Yes, you can. Just go on the uh, Google and uh, and so on. We got somebody from Botswana here. Um, okay, uh, Nikki, it's your turn. Uh, will bank freeze HELOCs in the near future? Should we take out the funds now? That's a good, excellent question. They will freeze the HELOCs, will, uh, if they haven't done so already. Uh, I mean, I know that in the last downturn, uh, I had quite a few, uh, of entity lines of credit HELOCs. And, uh, you know, you may think you got a line of credit for $100,000 one day, and the next day out of nowhere, uh, they shut it down, and so you have zero. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it can happen. It depends on how, um, you know, how this sort of uh, downturn plays out. Um, that happened a lot more with the major banks, the large national banks, uh, you know, the Wells Fargo, the Bank of America, of this world, the Chase of this world. Um, you know, so, yeah, it, it could be. So there's no guarantee that if you have a HELOC, uh, it will still be there. Uh, for you. So the question becomes, should we take the money out now? That's a good one. It depends on your situation because if you take the money out, at least it's set it aside. Um, and uh, it's sort of, uh, it, 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 it's, so if they shut it down, at least you've got your money. Um, but the downside is that now that you've taken money from the uh, account, you have to start paying interest on the money that you've uh, taken out. So there's now going to be a cost <coughs> associated with that withdrawal. Um, and but if you're disciplined, now this is the, uh, you know, the, the, the last part, uh, Sonny. If you're disciplined, then you can take that money out and put it into an account, which is going to earn you some money, okay? And then you use it when you, a, a good opportunity occurs or arises. Uh, you can then sort of, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, buy appreciating assets uh, when uh, good deals come. Now, I'm not a proponent of taking that money out and then, you know, I don't know, well, you can't go to Vegas now because it's shut down, but, you know, having to, you know, buy some clothes, uh, buy some cars, jewelry, and all the sort of knickknacks that or do that, as uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki says. Uh, I'm not a proponent of that. Okay, so if you can't, if you're not disciplined enough to, uh, to contain those urges to buy, uh, you know, 
for liabilities, then you know it's not worth it. But if you're disciplined and uh, and you know enough, and you feel that you know what you're doing, then it makes sense to take that money off the table out of your line of credit, put it aside in some kind of interest-bearing account. At least you get something. Uh, maybe it could be a money market account, uh, something that's higher beyond sort of a. a don't put it in a savings account earning zero. Put in something that earns something uh, to offset the interest that you're paying from the taking out money from the HELOC. And then park that money there and then wait for the opportunity to arise. And that way you do have money. Because in a, in a downturn, <coughs> liquidity really helps. Uh, reserves really help. And uh, your ability to be able to um, take action uh, to, uh, when opportunities arise really, really differentiates uh, you know, yourself from as I said before, um, you know, the grease will uh, dry up and the ability to get financing is going to get more and more difficult. Okay, go back to Instagram. How do you feel about MLOs? Lower price on MLOs. 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 This is from P. Mitchell, REI. MLOs. I'm sorry, you're going to have to. I'm sorry. Um, I don't understand what MLOs are, so you may want to, uh, you know. Do you have any good recommendation on repairing? Repairing. Um, I, for my rental properties, I do a lot of. Uh, I have home warranties on all my properties. Um, you know, there's lots of different home warranty companies out there. Uh, the one I use, um, you know, uh, they take care of the major stuff like your um, electrical, you know, electrical plumbing. HVAC, hot water heater, appliances, and things like that. So that way, all the sort of big ticket uh, you know, expenses, uh, I, I have uh, home warranty for, for, for those. And therefore, um, you know, anything that's outside of the home warranty is what my maintenance people take care of. So I sort of um, don't get these surprises. Uh, I have to buy a new AC unit or a new a uh, refrigerator or a new this, new that, which can be quite expensive, could be several hundred, even thousands of dollars, uh, and so on. Okay, keep going. Uh, Chan section, this is from Chang Yong. Uh, section 8 tenants have this stigma for being bad tenants. What are your thoughts? Oh, boy, I've talked about that so many times. Uh, there is a stereotype of Section 8 voucher holders. You know, so the stereotype is, you know, the gangsters, you know, hoodlums. You know, I don't know. You rent to them; they're going to trash and destroy your home. And you know, the neighbors are going to be up in arms. They're going to burn your house down. You know, a thousand people are going to live in your house. Da 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 da. I mean, all those stereotypes of house holders. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's not true, uh, but I'm just saying that there's a lot of people who don't fit that mold at all, at all whatsoever. They are no different than you and I, and they just want to live in a decent house. Decent neighborhood, uh, one of the rent decent landlords, just like you do. They, they they got children, they got families, they're very protective of their family, just like you are. And uh, you know, they don't want to be shot at no more than you want to be shot at. And the only difference, or the main difference, they don't have the money to be able to leave one bad environment and go to a better environment. That's the only difference, really. Uh, so once you get that, once you understand that, uh, you can really develop a business model around uh, that group. People. I call them tier one uh, voucher holders, and uh, it works. I mean, they come to your house, they take care of your home. Uh, they are so eternally grateful that you gave them the opportunity to live in your home, and they'll be respectful of your home. Uh, they'll be they're just they're just so thankful for the opportunity. And uh, but they pay their rent, they take care of the house, they're pleasant to deal with. And more importantly, they stay a long time. Um, so the case in point is that, let's say, go back to that $4,000 scenario. Uh, if I rent, if I have a rent of $4,000, and again, if you're in a different market, $4,000 may seem exorbitant wherever you are, but in high price market like Washington, D.C., and some parts of California, New York, Boston, so on, $4,000 is not really a lot of money for, for a house. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing unusual, let's just put it that way. So if you rent to a market renter paying four thousand dollars, there's a pretty good chance that after a year or two they're going to leave because they're going to buy their own home. Um, because I would, I wouldn't pay four thousand dollars a month to some place. Um, you know, at some point you say this is crazy. <laughs> Let's go buy our own house. 
So uh, for the voucher holder, that's not the case. They're not going to buy that house because they don't have the income. So they're just looking for a place where they can sort of be settled. The kids can have a decent school. They'll be close to good amenities and so forth and so on. So they stay a long time. And my longest tenant, as I said, believe it or not, is 23 years. And uh, 23 years uh, on a 15-year mortgage and so on. So, um, yeah, it works. Okay. Uh, Nikki, your turn. And you section eight a subject to Oh, so okay. Uh Instagram folks, you are gonna get cut off. Uh Laura's gonna show her face. <laughs> she's the one that scolded me. So she, she's just scared to show her face. <laughs> so she, uh, you're gonna have to we're gonna cut you off in a minute. Uh bigger uh, what's it called? Instagram. Uh we tune in uh into bigger pockets uh Instagram feed to reconnect. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to turn it down. I'm assuming that you, you, you want to continue. I'm assuming that you want me to keep on blabbing away, as, uh, as what, uh, what, what, as what uh, Laura told me. And, but if you want to continue, we're going to continue on YouTube and Facebook. But for Instagram, please re-dial in, re-tune in, so you can continue the discussion. Okay? So join us right back. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'm going to answer Brian's question. Which is good. Hold on a second, Brian. You good? Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. So can we subject? Can you subject to a? Can you sub? Can you sectionate a subject to? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, as long as you got title. Uh, because as part of the process for uh, Section 8, uh, they are going to, you have to prove that you have title to the property, okay? So uh, if you, you know, you're going to have to prove that you have uh, you know, a stake in the home. So if you can provide that with a deed and things like that, then you're good. Um, now if your subject to doesn't put you on title, then uh, they may not uh, allow you to rent that place to a voucher holder. It's to avoid a lot of scams. Some people would, um, you know, uh, enter into uh, the Section 8 contract even though they didn't own the house. Okay, so uh, HUD requires part of that whole lease process. Uh, they have this document called RSTA, Request for Tenancy Approval, RSTA. Uh, within that packet, <laughs> One of the things that they're going to ask for is proof that you own this house. Uh, typically, it's a deed. Okay, so if that deed doesn't reflect your name, uh, then you have to confirm that you are in fact the legal owner and you have the legal authority to collect money or rent from this house. So, uh, so you can do a subject to because I've done subject to before, and um, you know, uh, as long as it's subject to whereby you take title, as opposed to just taking the uh, taking over the mortgage and leaving the previous owner. On title, then technically, you know, you don't. You know, as long as you are on the deed and, uh, and it's on public record that you own the house, then you shouldn't have a problem doing a subject to, um, you know, and so on. So, okay, keep questions going. And on Instagram, so, so, uh, Nikki, do you want to throw another one, please? Okay, so look, what are the tips for getting into renting? What are tips? Or getting into renting to Section 8 holders. Okay, this is from Brenda Grace. Uh, what are the tips for getting into renting to Section 8 holders? What are the tips? Okay, so what I do is that you, uh, when you eventually have your home ready for, for renting, then when you market and you advertise, then you want to place on your advertisement. Uh, nowadays, everything is kind of going online. So you go to um, you know your online sources wherever that may be, and I do a, a very detailed uh, not detailed but a, a, a nice write up of the home and uh, you know, all the salient features the amenities of the home has to offer, and then I also put on there uh, section eight welcome, okay section eight welcome, okay so I place that in the ad in the description, and that way uh, if person that does have a voucher, then they know that I'm open to considering a voucher holder. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. 
so make sure on your advertisements that you put Section 8 well. That's, anyway, that's what I do. Uh, that's up to you if you want to do that. Uh, but that's what I do. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, this is from Chiabello, Chiabello24. How do you find Section 8 tenants? I think I just answered that question. Um, just advertising your local, um, yeah, you find out where the voucher, you find out where the local housing authority, where do they tell their voucher holders uh, to go look? And then you make sure that you place your advertisement in those locations, uh, those websites or lists or whatever it is that they have. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Shabella. Uh, what does, this is fix and flip, fix and flip funded. What does, what is on lookout for when wholesaling? The best contracts to use for professionals that do not want to put money up. What does not sure the question? What does what does on look out for? What do you look out for when wholesaling? I don't wholesale. Best contracts to use. I'm sorry, I don't I'm not really a wholesaler. Uh, I work with wholesalers and uh, so they bring me deals. And uh, they know what, what I'm looking for. They bring me the deals. And uh, once they bring me a deal, uh, then there's different ways we can proceed. Uh, I can take over, uh, you know, the contract. Uh, so essentially, if they put the contract in Entity A, then uh, they assign me the interest in Entity A in exchange for some kind of uh, referral fee or wholesale fee and things like that. Or uh, they can just assign uh, the contract to my entity. So I take title in my entity as opposed to their entity. That's another way. So there's lots of different ways to work with wholesalers. It just depends how flexible they are and uh, how experienced they are and, uh, and so on. Okay, Nikki, it's your turn. Uh, this is from I Will Not Comply. Keith. <laughs> Keith, okay, you will not comply, huh? You're a radical, huh? My local real estate advisor says to buy low-end homes because the market is stronger and ROI is higher. What is your advice? My local real estate advisor says, says to buy low-end homes because the market is stronger and ROI. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you will get uh, a greater return on investment because of the fact that uh, you're paying less for the house. And uh, so the, the ratio between rent and the, uh, what's it called, the debt is uh, a lot more favorable. Um, you know, so, you know, I think they have that count, that 1% that, uh, rule. Uh, so if you buy in lower end prices or lower end homes, then, you know, instead of getting 1% return, you can get, get, be able to get 2%. Uh, so for example, what I mean, what I mean by 1% is that uh, $100,000 house rents for $1,000. Okay. So if you go to a lower end area, you may be able to buy uh, houses for fifty thousand dollars, and if you're able to get that rented for a thousand, then you're now getting two percent. Uh, you know the ratio is there. The problem with lower end homes or lower end no neighborhoods is that uh, you know, um, I mean, it is what it is. You know, you, you may get uh, sometimes it, what looks good on paper uh, or an Excel test spreadsheet isn't always what actually Appears in reality. Uh, what I mean by that is, you may be more challenged to get your money. Uh, you may have more to deal with more drama. Uh, you may have, uh, you know, more, you know, more, more, more time, um, you know, required to manage those, those properties. The turnover may be higher. The vacancies may be higher. Not everybody wants to live in a low end area or uh, you know, low priced area. Not everybody wants to do that. And the people that do live there, especially if it's a, a high crime, blighted area, it's cheaper, but not everybody wants to live there. And uh, you may have a situation where your turnover costs are higher. People go there, stay there for a while, then move on, and, and so on. So in the end, uh, you may not really gain that much. You may, in theory, get more money on a month basis. However, your other costs, uh, your turnover costs, your vacancy costs, your drama costs, your, you know, you know, the peace of mind cost, it, it may, you know, uh, throw it over. So I'm not a great proponent of that. I mean, you know, when you start, you got to start where you are. So if, if that's what you can afford, then so be it. You start, you get going, okay? And, uh, but you know, I, I, I believe that uh, the key to success is to have a house where you get a good tenant who 
wants to stay there for a long time. They take care of your house, pleasant to deal with, they pay their rent, and they, you know, they just, uh, you know, a dream come true. So that's what I, that's the business model I sort of evolved to. But when you're starting out, you start where you can. And uh, if what you can get is a lower end home, then so be it. Get going, build the momentum. And, um, you know, if it works for you, make it work. And there are a lot of people that are quite successful uh, utilizing that model. Um, you know, so find people who are doing that successfully and try to get them to uh, show you the ropes and mentor you and, uh, and so on. So it sounds like you've got an advisor who is somewhat uh, familiar with that strategy. So uh, maybe they can help you, uh, you know, execute it. Okay. Good question, Keith. Uh, let's have a look. Um, what does one look out for? Can you explain the 1% tip rule? I think I did that today. Uh, 1% is that you buy a house for 100000 you rent it out for $1,000. So the $1,000 rent, monthly rent, is approximately 1% of the 100000 i.e. the value of the house. Okay? 2% is if you can either um, get $2,000 Okay, uh, rent for the same hundred thousand dollar house. So that way, now your rent is two times or two percent of the uh, the value, and so on. Or if you get a yeah, so it's, it's it's the ratio of the rent that you get versus the value of the home, and um, that's the one percent two percent rules. Okay, let's have a look. What happens if the clients don't pay rent during COVID nineteen? This is from Dancer T one on Instagram. Uh, what happens if the client doesn't pay rent? Well, what happens when the tenant doesn't pay rent? You really don't have a whole lot of choices. Okay? In this COVID-19 time, especially if there are moratoriums wherever you are, then you may not be able to go to the legal system. A lot of courts are closed anyway. Uh, but you can't even start the process to evict. Okay? So you either have to wait until the moratorium is finished or you try to work with the tenant and uh, you know, hopefully they will start paying you whatever they can. Uh, maybe you get some kind of payment plan. Uh, maybe you, you know, you, you work something out whereby um, you, know, uh, you know, you. What I do anyway. What I what I've done for my tenants is I provided uh, you know my sister put together a list of all the um, uh, organizations locally that are helping. With ten, uh, ten. There's a website called uh, Find Help, Find Help dot org. Find Help dot org. I think it's uh, national. Um, where you go in there, you plug in your zip code, and it comes with a whole list of different organizations that are uh, provide assistance. Uh, so you may want to check that out. Uh, we offer that plus other things uh, to uh, our tenants. Uh, to let them know that you know at a difficult times so these are organizations out here that are um, you know trying to help that, that have resources whether it be assistance with utilities, assistance with rent, assistance with food, assistance with mortgages. And, you know, that's just uh, uh, a, a resource that we share with our tenants. Also, how to apply, how to apply for unemployment. So you know, we're trying to reach out to our tenants and let them know that you know we understand it's not easy. But we're doing our part. Uh, I had my assistant reach out to every one of my tenants just to kind of touch base and uh, make sure they're okay and, uh, and so on. In fact, I didn't say that, did I? In fact, last week, okay, last week, did you believe that on April the 31st, about a week ago, I got a call. Uh, Dr. Joe was on NBC Channel 4. Uh, here in Washington, D.C. I was, uh, I made a cameo, a cameo appearance on NBC Channel 4. They were doing an article, uh, a, a, a little, what do they call it, a segment? A segment? They're doing a segment on, it's April the 30th, yeah, 30th of April. Tomorrow is May the 1st. What are landlords, you know, what should tenants do? Okay, that was the trend. So they had the Channel 4 uh, Consumer Affairs lady, a uh, real nice lady. Uh, we'll do an article about that, and, and and you know she reached out to me uh, through my uh, you know through my uh, uh, PR uh, uh, representative, and they contacted me, and uh, the story was that this this tenant uh, you know was renting from a landlord 
who were just difficult. You know, they were uncompromising, and uh, all they wanted was their money, and that was it. And so they wanted to have a landlord perspective on that, and what should tenants do uh, in situations like that. So um, lo and behold, I reached out to Dr. Joe. So Dr. Joe is on Channel 4, and locally here in Washington, D.C., and so I gave my sort of uh, 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 thoughts on what tenants can do. And, um, you know, because most landlords don't want to evict. Uh, it's very expensive. Uh, it's very energy consuming. And at the end of the day, there's really no winners out of all that stuff. So I kind of uh, gave my thoughts on that. I think it's pretty good. Um, maybe I'll share it out. I don't know how to share it out, but maybe it's a nice little forum. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to Nikki and uh, she can look at it and, uh, you know. And so on. This nice little article. Uh, uh, anyway, going back to Nikki, it's your turn. What about leasing property directly to the housing authority and let them manage the property? Uh, what about leasing property directly to the housing authority? Let, what about that? Um, I don't know if they do that. Le uh, leasing property direct. So I'm renting directly to the housing authority and. Uh, and I don't think that's the Section 8 process because normally the Section 8 process, I think, I could be wrong here, I'll uh, rehab my, uh, is that you as the owner, you you advertise at a voucher holder, uh, applies for your home, and then you rent it to them. Um, I've never done a master lease with the housing authority whereby I'm sending, I'm availing uh, the property to them. And uh, they essentially uh, build a house up with whoever they want and so on. Maybe that, I don't think so. It's, it's, I know it's not a Section 8 program. That it could be a subset of another program uh, which the organization, the housing authority may run or some nonprofit run through that. I know I've been approached by a lot of these sort of, uh, what do you call those folks, uh, assisted living uh, people who want to borrow my, so who want to lease my home, okay? And so that where they can run their business from that home, uh, whether it be a sort of a, 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 a you know an assisted living facility whereby they have people who share rooms and and, and so on. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you can, there are plenty of people do that. So if that's what you're saying, uh, it works. In fact, some people can do that for for for, um, for Airbnb. Uh, they rent uh, a property and then they turn around and rent it. Airbnb. I mean, that business, part, that whole Airbnb business model is definitely going through some transition right now uh, and so on. But uh, hopefully, I, I, but I haven't personally rented directly to a housing authority. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Uh, it may. Uh, I'm just, uh, if you're going to do that, you want to make sure you have some assurances uh, in terms of who's responsible for repairs, <coughs> who's responsible for maintenance, and, uh, you know, and what kind of screening are they going to take? Uh, they're going to do, uh, you know, for the occupants of the home. So that's something I would uh, definitely, you know, uh, look into before you go down that path. I'm not saying it's a bad one, but it makes sense. It could it could work for you. Um, I just haven't done that myself. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, go back to Instagram. How did I? How do I find out how much my home would rent for under Section Eight? This is from Maro, A29. Uh, how much do I, how do I find out how much my home would rent for? Okay, so what you do, uh, Maro, is that you go to your local housing authority, uh, either websites or you give them a call. Most places, they, uh, the rent is based on two factors, okay? It's based on either the, the zip code or the neighborhood where the house uh, is located. Number one, and number two is the number of bedrooms that the house has. Okay, so the more bedrooms, the higher the rent. So how do you find out how much your? That's your question specifically. You go to your housing authority website, or you contact your uh, contact them, and say, "My, I have a property, one two three Main Street. It's in zip code A." Okay, and they'll tell you for zip code A. Then if it's a one bedroom, you'll get this amount. If it's a two bedroom, you get that amount. A three bedrooms, it's about four bedrooms, seven, five bedrooms, and so forth. So they'll tell you. And then the other thing you need to find out is 
does that number which they're sharing with you include or exclude utilities? Because sometimes these, these housing projects are a little tricky. Uh, they sometimes quote you a high number, uh, but that's based on the assumption that the landlord is paying all the utilities. And I strongly do not recommend that you pay any utilities if at all possible. Uh, because if you if you pay the utility, you know what's going to happen. Your tenant is going to run a car wash business uh, from your house um, because they're not paying the uh, the water. Uh, they may even offer a you know a laundry service because they're not paying for laundry, electric, and water, and so on. I mean, in other words, the people abuse it. Uh, when you go there in the summertime, the AC is blasting and all the windows are open because the utility is paid for by the landlord. So I don't recommend that you pay utilities. So you want to make sure that the numbers that they're quoting you either include or exclude utilities. And, uh, and that way you can actually determine what exactly you will actually get. Because sometimes what they tell you you're going to get, what you actually get are two different things. And I've been down that road before, and uh, it's just uh, heading some warning uh, that uh, you know you do your due diligence. Uh, and some some places, uh, uh, it's the inspector that gives the final uh, determinant uh, as to what the rent is. And uh, although in theory you can get X, uh, the inspector may show up and say, "I'm sorry, but you're going to get Y." And at that point, it's take it or leave it. So it's kind of tricky. So that's why it's important to understand the nuances of your specific local housing authority, uh, PHA, Public Housing Authority, uh, if you want to go down the uh, explore the Section 8 program. It's a real great program, Section 8, but it's, you know, there's a lot of nuances that uh, it's, you know, it's worthwhile to, uh, to research beforehand and so on. Okay, Nikki, your turn. During the downturn, this is from James. Uh, during the downturn, have you seen an increase in Section 8 tenants or people needing places to live? Exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, in a downturn, I think you've heard that story, uh, which I shared many, many times. Uh, I used to live in a property in Washington, D.C. I lived there. And in a downturn in the mid-90s, uh, we moved from Washington to Maryland. And uh, the property I put up for rent, I had a voucher holder who came there and said she didn't like my house where I lived. It didn't have a jacuzzi, it didn't have a hard floor and stainless steel appliances. Uh, but the, 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 the story was essentially when the market shifts, uh, all bets are off. Your competition changes. Uh, you know, I'm now competing when the market shifts with other flippers, fix and flippers, who, couldn't, who, can't, who cannot sell their home. Okay, so they can't sell their home. And now they have no choice but to either reduce the selling price, but because they pay too much, they don't have a whole lot of options there, or they're going to re or they're going to replace their house, which they otherwise would have flipped. They're going to now put it up for rent. So my house is not compete with that house. Okay. So the guy who has a condo, okay, the guy who is uh, got this beautiful condo, his game plan or her game plan is to sell it. Okay, but they can't sell it because the market is tanked. Okay, so again, their choice is to rent it. So now a condo, you have an apartment building, you're now competing with this condo. Hopefully that makes sense. So the, the point is that the dynamics changes in a, in a downturn. And the tenant, from a tenant perspective, Section 8 tenant perspective, their rent is based on their income. So if their income stays the same, then their rent stays the same. So you know, so if you're them, you're going to gravitate to the better product, uh, nicer house, nicer area, all the amenities, because your rent's the same. Uh, so, 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 uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, the nature of the competition changes. Uh, the type of people, uh, you know, uh, that you're looking for changes, and uh, there's going to be more people who are looking. But a lot of people have also got bad credit. A lot of people are being evicted. A lot of people, you know, and so on. So, so your due diligence, your screening becomes more important. And if you're not careful, if you're not able to compete, uh, then your turnover cost, your vacancy cost is going to be a lot higher. And, uh, and this is another tip uh, from experience. 
is that if you can't rent your place, because there aren't many people that can afford your place or qualify for your place, then in order to attract people, you're going to have to do some crazy stuff. Like, you're going to have to give out free toasters, you know, zero security deposit for applications. You know, you're going to have to start discounting your rent just to get people to, to, to apply. And uh, I've been down that road before. It's not pretty. Uh, all it does, it cuts into your profits. And all it does, it makes you desperate. And the uh, last thing you want to be in a, a landlord-friendly jurisdiction is to be desperate for somebody. Somebody comes there. And next thing you know, they're not the tenant that you thought. And then next thing you know, you know you got problems on your hands. So, so yeah. So I uh, hope I answered your question, James. Let's go over to Instagram. Uh, meeting with the tenant of my first rental tonight. Oh boy, tonight! Congratulations, Joe. This is from Joseph Westerman. Uh, meeting with the tenant of my first rental tonight to sign a lease. Any last-minute tips? Well, congratulations, Joe. Uh, last tip, I would suggest that you do a couple of things. One, make sure that you have a pre-inspection form, um, you know, which details the condition of your property on day one. Okay, you want to make sure that you, as you go through the house, before the tenant moves in, you go through this checklist to verify the condition of the house today before they moved in. Uh, because that way, when they leave, any damages uh, was obviously caused by the tenant because you had a, a baseline of, uh, you know, inspection that was done. Uh, that's one tip I would suggest. Two is make sure you don't collect any checks, personal checks uh, today. Uh, last thing you need is to sign over a lease and somebody gives you a bounce check. Uh, now they're in your house, they have a legal document, and now you have to evict them and you have no rent. And you have no security deposit. So that's another suggestion. What's another one I can give you? Uh, you know, Make sure, my thing at the end of the day, make sure you got a strong lease. Hope you got a good lease that's compliant with whatever the regulations are uh, in your state, in your locality. Make sure you have lead disclosures. Make sure that you're compliant with all disclosure laws. Make sure that, I mean, the whole, I mean, I could talk about that all day long. Um, but uh, in a snapshot, since uh, I don't have a whole lot of time, just make sure that you, you take the time to nurture a good relationship with your tenant. Uh, because if you do that and treat them with respect, with courtesy and um, you know, but don't let them walk over you. Uh, you know, you should be good. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going over to the last round because it is 4:28. I've been here for an hour and a half, and Laura is getting angry. Laura is getting upset. She's shouting at me. <laughs> She's scolding me again. <laughs> she wants to go home. <laughs> Tired of being here, <laughs> so you're gonna have to try to uh, <laughs> tell them what you think of, <laughs> or you're gonna have to show you some love so I can tell her. I'm sorry, but there's too much love over here, so yeah, I'm not gonna stay all longer. So, what, what's it gonna be? Should I shut it down, or you want to show me some love? Tell me, tell me. Oh. <laughs> I need more love. <laughs> Okay, now, now, now you're talking. I, I come see the love on uh, Facebook. Do it, do it, do it. Uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube? I don't know. Uh, I, you know. Anyway, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> I tell you. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, this is from Nikki. Uh, oh, no, no. Nikki, it's your turn. Oh, the love is coming now from Instagram. I'll tell you. Okay, Brenda. I don't think I should have Brenda already. If the section of house, if the house title is under an LLC, does it make it harder to get a Section 8 RFPA approved? RFPA is a request for tenancy approval. Um, also, do you recommend keeping any houses in a person's name for easier future funding options? Uh, it, it shouldn't make any difference, uh, Brenda, if your house is under an LLC. I have properties under LLCs uh, with a Section 8 program. I also have properties in personal name. I have a mixture. So it really doesn't matter. The important thing is that you have to prove that you actually own the house, okay? So your deed should match. Uh, they'll probably want your articles, uh, you know, to, to prove that you actually, uh, you know, the LLC is, is, uh, is, is been filed and is active. And uh, they'll want a deed 
And uh, if you're going to manage it yourself, that's fine. If you're not going to manage it yourself, you're going to give it to a management company, and they'll probably want a management agreement between your LLC and the management company. And they'll want you to fill out your W-9 uh, you know, with the name of the LLC. And they'll also want to probably ask you to fill a W-9 for the management company because the rent's going to the management company as opposed to the rent going to you. Uh, so if the rent is going to you, your entity, then obviously uh, you know you don't need you, all you need is one W nine. If there are two entities, then i.e. the management company and the owner, then you're going to have to fill out uh, two there. So uh, so there, yeah. So that's the RFTA. Uh, also, do you recommend uh, keeping any houses in a person's name for easy? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's nothing wrong with keeping your name. I mean, it's not easily recommended, but uh, it's okay. And putting your name, it, it does allow you to get sort of the traditional 30-year uh, financing, which is usually cheaper, and uh, and so on. So you know, some people, what they do is they um, buy in the uh, in their personal name and then do it the other way, transfer it to their LLC. Uh, and then when they're ready to um, you know refinance again, then they put it back in their own name. Uh, the other problem is that with that is that every time you transfer title, uh, then uh, you may be liable or subject to what we call transfer taxes. And uh, in this area, it, transfer taxes can be very expensive and several thousands of dollars. So, um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things where you're going to have to weigh up the pros and cons of that. But you can do what you're saying, uh, no problem. Thanks a lot, Brenda, for question. Uh, okay, next one is go back to uh, Instagram. So if I follow that model, what kind of annual ROI can I expect to make? Um, if you follow my model, what's the ROI? It depends. It depends on where, you know, I mean, my properties, I mean, again, uh, typically I want cash flow. So typically the cash flow is anywhere from, um, I don't know, 500 bucks to 1500 bucks a month. Uh, it just depends on the asset. Uh, all the houses uh, are in passive, uh, what I call appreciation, uh, and so you know values increase, um, and so on. So I want both appreciation and I also want cash flow. That's what my business model is all about, and that's the reason why I take a three bedroom and turn it into a five to get more rent, and uh, and that's the reason why I have a five because there aren't many five bedroom houses where we live. So I have a product that's in high demand, and low supply. High demand, low supply. So in a downturn like we're experiencing right now, uh, there are a lot of other people who are having five bedroom houses, and uh, so it's low supply. But also, uh, I have very nice houses. I don't know if you saw that article I wrote uh, uh, probably like two, three weeks ago on bigger pockets. I, I, I provide some photographs of the kind of houses I have, and uh, they're, they're nice couple. These are H G the quality home and um, and the tenants once they get in there they, they don't leave never it's not in there they don't leave they're there they're there for, for the long haul 5, 10, 15, 20 years so that's my business model so when I if you look at that and add all that stuff together your ROI can be fantastic uh, you got appreciation you got tax benefits you got cash flow you're able to leverage this asset, and um, I don't know. Uh, it, it's pretty good. Hope I ask your question, uh, Warrior. Warrior Bloodline. Okay, uh, Nikki, it's your turn. And uh, you're going to have to tell Nikki, or well, I don't know if I tell her or you tell her, because uh, I don't know if she, she wants to wrap it up as well, because I'm, I'm going on for an hour and a half. And uh, so, Nikki, do you want me to cut it out? or? <laughs> So it's, up, it's up to me or it's up to Nikki? It's up to me. Nikki, I need some feedback. You want to go home? <laughs> uh, uh, or do I continue? Maybe I'll continue for another five minutes. Uh, so you got, I hope that you... Uh, Nikki is the, um, the the producer, the social media manager. He's a big shot at Bigger Pocket. Uh, a huge big shot. And uh, he's the one that... Uh, what's the called, uh, invited me to be, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, what's it called, 
she's the one that invited me to be part of the, the Vegan Pocket uh, social media platform. So I want to thank her for giving me the opportunity and uh, and so on. So I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna kind of wrap it up now because uh, it's a long day and let's have a look. Uh, so with that said and done, I want to thank everybody uh, for being a part of this uh, live stream today. And I will be back in two weeks uh, from now. So um, my goal is that I want to be uh, obviously uh, uh, provide quality content uh, to the bigger pockets community. That's my goal. Uh, my goal is to increase the uh, the number of people that watch uh, or tune in uh, to uh, you know uh, what's it called the, the live streams every two weeks. So please share that with your uh, your your network. That Dr. Joe is on every other Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I think Nikki was telling me I've got like 4,000 views or something like that. And I told her my goal is by the next time around, I'm going to get 5,000 views. Okay, so I need, I need everybody to spread the word that Dr. Joe is on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube on Bigger Pockets at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So tell your world, tell your friends. Tell everybody, tell your friends on Jupiter, Mars, uh, Saturn, <laughs> Neptune, uh, wherever you are, spread the word that Dr. Joe is at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Next time around, I'm going to have another great topic. And um, yeah, looking forward to uh, being a part of uh, the community. And everybody, again, have yourself a safe, wonderful weekend. And, uh, you know, you know, make sure that uh, you practice uh, distance social di I say distance learning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, make sure you practice social distancing, and because I want to make sure that you're safe. And uh, you know, God willing, we'll meet in two weeks' time, 3 p.m. Dr. Joe, signing out. Thanks.